Thanks for the introduction. Uh, the uh, time for speaking increases with the temperature. Dear Chairman, uh, dear uh, colleagues, I will uh, provide a little summary of the 2013 guidelines regarding uh, stable coronary artery disease. And I will uh, focus here on new uh, points that were introduced in between the uh, time period of 2006 and 2013. First of all, there is a broader consideration of functional and coronary artery disease as cause of symptoms. And as my colleague uh, talked about before, that's uh, probably because uh, uh, our colleague Udo Sektem is one of uh, the uh, authors of these guidelines and he tests all almost all patients with normal coronary arteries with acetylcholine. So I don't want to uh, focus on this, on uh, coronary spasm and endothelial dysfunction. I will focus on the following points, namely the separate consideration of the processes of diagnosis and risk stratification. This is sometimes arbitrary. This uh, distinction, sometimes it's very important. And it's also very important with respect to a very new point in these guidelines when it comes to stress testing without imaging. A next new point is that uh, the authors aim that the guidelines are really based on pretest probabilities of uh, stable coronary artery disease. And this holds true in a very little part of the guidelines when it comes uh, to new data on pretest probabilities probabilities, especially in new modalities that are uh, used in the pathways for diagnosis and risk stratification. And least but, last but not least, there is a larger role of modern imaging techniques such as cardiac magnetic resonance and CT cornea angiography, uh, but there is also a very critical appraisal of these new uh, modalities in the guidelines. You all know the concept of pretest probabilities of disease. And this uh, pretest probability of coronary artery disease is very easily estimated by age, gender, and symptoms. And in the new guidelines, you may recognize that there are no longer uh, three categories, but more categories. Uh, it depends which uh, modalities you use uh, or uh, to make the choice for evaluation if you have uh, four or even five categories for pretest probabilities. In the older guidelines, we only had a low risk of uh, or a low probability of coronary artery disease going from 0 to 15 percent, and then an intermediate probability going from 15 to 85 percent, and a high probability of disease of more than 85 percent. What did these uh, risk uh, assessment tell us before? It told us and it tells us, uh, all of us uh, in the new guidelines, that patients with a low pretest probability of coronary artery disease shouldn't undergo any further testing because of diagnostic reasons. And in contrast, patients with a high risk of uh, pretest probability of coronary artery disease should undergo directly that to coronary angiography because with respect to diagnosis, the uh, modalities that, were, that are used non-invasively don't add any uh, diagnostic value. It might be that uh, because of prognostic considerations that it might sometimes make sense to use the tests anyway, but not because of diagnostic reasons. On the other hand, patients in the intermediate pretest probability range uh, undergo non invasive testing. However, this uh, intermediate probability range now has been split, and it depends a little bit what method you consider for further testing. One split was set at 65%, and what's uh, quite arbitrary. 
So it goes from 15 to 65 percent, the lower range of uh, intermediate probability, and from 65 to 85, the higher range of uh, intermediate probability. Why is that important? Because in the intermediate range, that's the domain of non-invasive testing. And if a patient is in the lower part of uh, the intermediate uh, pretest probability, then exercise ECG can be considered for diagnostic reasons. However, also here, cardiac imaging modalities as uh, stress echo, cardiac magnetic resonance, nuclear cardiology methods uh, should be actually uh, preferred if there is local expertise and availability. In contrast, if patients have a higher intermediate probability from 66 to 85 percent, then uh, a stress Imaging modality should be preferred at uh, the place of a stress testing without imaging. And only a stress testing should be used as a first choice if stress imaging modalities aren't available at uh, the place. Then there is another splitting in the intermediate probability uh, of coronary artery disease that is set at 50%. 50% per se is also very arbitrary, but it's based on the fact that coronary CT angiography has a very high negative predictive value, namely to exclude coronary artery disease. And that's the reason why in patients uh, with a pretest probability from 25 to 50 percent, uh, coronary CT angiography can be considered as a diagnostic tool. And of course, one has to consider comorbidities, heart rate, and if a calcium score is done, coronary calcifications, because if a calcium score of more than uh, 400, the Agatson score of more, for, of more than 400 is there, then uh, the stenosis are uh, severely overestimated. If you now have used one of these possibilities, there are still a uh, very uh, a lot of possibilities. There can be uh, an unclear result. My su suggestion there is that you don't use uh, several non-invasive tests, except in special patients. Uh, in daily practice, I generally go from an unclear cardiac imaging test directly to invasive cornea angiography that is uh, actually allowed here. If there is ischemia, then there is a next step, and we will look at that uh, afterwards. There is the question of prognosis. If there is no ischemia and no stenosis, then in very selective patients, uh, functional coronary artery disease can be considered. One important point, in addition to the facts I uh, presented you before, is that uh, patients with a lower uh, ejection fraction, uh, below 50%, and uh, typical angina can undergo cornea angiography irrespective of uh, symptoms. Why has the value, the, pro, progno, the diagnostic value of uh, stress testing been uh, reduced? That's because of the studies we all know very well that the diagnostic accuracy of stress testing as compared to uh, cardiac imaging modality is much lower. But we could discuss that for hours. And I'm not so sure if we should uh, actually reduce the value of stress testing so much as the guidelines did here. So we now have looked at the diagnostic part of the evaluation. We now have to go from diagnosis to prognostic considerations to decide when if action is uh, needed. And in the guidelines, there is that uh, very easy uh, chart. And this chart can be used for exercise stress testing, not for diagnosis, but for 
uh, prognostic assessment. And first of all, it's uh, only a modified uh, chart from a Duke treadmill score. The Duke treadmill score uses the time on the treadmill according to standardized protocols. We can't use that because we use different protocols on the bike. So we have to convert uh, the uh, physical performance to metabolic equivalence and then uh, see if the patient has symptoms and how the performance of a patient is and if we have ischemic ECG changes and as a result we will get uh, average annual mortality rate and the annual mortality rate is actually then uh, the measure for uh, risk when it comes to low intermediate and high risk in stress testing. When it comes to imaging modalities uh, one should aim to assess the extent of ischemia. This is based on uh, studies that have shown uh, retrospectively, but with uh, very sophisticated uh, statistical methods, that in patients with less than 10% myocardium ischemic, patients with revascularization here in gray have a higher mortality rate than patients treated medically. In contrast, patients with more than 10% myocardium ischemic, patients with medical therapy have a higher mortality rate than patients who are treated uh, with revascularization. So, uh, in ischemia testing, the extent of ischemia plays a pivotal role. And that's, that has been summarized here. The exercise stress ECG, with uh, more than 3% uh, percent per year mortality rate as a high, uh, with 1% to 3% as an intermediate, and with less than 1% uh, per year risk as a low risk. And about ischemia, we have already talked. With coronary CT angiography, uh, coronary anatomy uh, standards are used to uh, evaluate risk, and of course, that's based on findings that we know uh, from invasive uh, cardiology. Based on these prognostic considerations, we have to uh, go to action. And the action is based on these uh, risk stratification categories. Low-risk patients should first undergo trial of optical medical therapy. Uh, patients with an intermediate probability, it depends a little bit on uh, symptom severity, comorbidities, uh, patient preferences, if we go first to trial of optical medical therapy or if we go directly to coronary angiography. And in patients with high risk, one should go to invasive coronary angiography and there if we don't have prior uh, non-invasive ischemia testing in stenosis with unclear stenosis degree, uh, FFR, FFR should be used to actually estimate the uh, relevance of hemodynamic uh, severity. When it comes to revascularization, and that's another discussion we could uh, actually uh, talk about for hours, when to revascularize uh, interventionally, when to uh, refer a patient to cabbage surgery. And here we have a very easy chart that leads us uh, the direction. And uh, in one to double vessel disease, not involving the uh, proximal LID, then uh, the patient uh, certainly can undergo PCI according to the guidelines. If a proximal LID is involved, then there should be the heart team discussion. And note that uh, heart team is really a very fancy uh, term because uh, there is also a trademark here. And if you have a triple vessel disease and the low syntax Core, then uh, there should be a heart team discussion if uh, the patient should undergo PCI or cabbage. If you have a high syntax score, the syntax score is uh, based on uh, cornea anatomy and uh, stenosis degree, uh, and there is low uh, surgical risk when the patient should undergo uh, cabbage. <laughs> 
Besides all these points, I think it's very important always not to forget that we should always care about risk factor evaluation, lifestyle and pharmacologic management of our patients to address quality of life and to consider pros and cons of different antianginal drugs we use in daily practice. Thank you very much for your attention. Vielen Dank, Michael, für diese äh, zeitlich limitierte äh, die, die, die Zusammenfassung. Gibt es gerade Fragen, Kommentare vom äh, Auditorium? Nicht? Dann wem darf ich das Wort zuerst übergeben? Go ahead. Ja. Michael, uh, you nicely summarized uh, when we should test, but uh, what about the routine checkup of the middle-aged manager uh, who feels himself still fully in charge and not limited by exercise? We all test this middle-aged manager uh, in daily practice, but according to the guidelines, if he is completely asymptomatic and hasn't any additional risk factors, we shouldn't test him and discuss uh, that with him. How do you test for being asymptomatic? Excuse me? How do you test for being asymptomatic and uh, full exercise capacity? This is wishy-washy. That's actually a very important question. Uh, in general, uh, taking the history, I see if he's practicing, practicing sports. And practicing sports, uh, let's say uh, biking, uh, mountain biking, or uh, playing tennis, I know if he does that uh, competitively or uh, on a regular basis, he has at least a physical performance of 10 mets. And uh, 10 mets are consistent with a very good prognosis. And if he's uh, asymptomatic during that uh, activity, then uh, it's uh, certainly reasonable uh, to assume that he's asymptomatic. In contrast, if a manager has uh, really a sedentary lifestyle, then uh, it might be reasonable if uh, he wants, for example, start a sports program that I do an ergometry. So the answer uh, in the end is uh, there are guidelines, but there is also the individual and we have to cite to decide individually when it makes sense to test this manager. So, uh, in summary, if you're not sure about exercise capacity according to history, you put him on the bike and you verify whether he's truly asymptomatic and has a full exercise capacity, but then, if so, you stop any further risk assessment. Uh, risk assessment with respect uh, to uh, ischemia, but not uh, with respect to risk factors. Okay. Questions from the audience? I have a question to you. How many of you is using this course for exercise stress testing with a high, a low, intermediate and high risk? You presented that, uh, which is now introduced. It was already before used, but who is using that? Please raise your, raise your hands. One, two. Huh? What type of patients? In that situation, in that situation when you have a patient who is symptomatic, you do an exercise stress test, and then you can assess this exercise duration, ST segment, uh, uh, if it's uh, stress limiting or not, uh, these, these parameters which were presented. Who is using this course? Um, do you have an idea why we don't use this course in our daily practice? First of all, um, it's quite complicated uh, to convert uh, the um, performance to METs if one hasn't it on the screen anyway, but most of the newer programs have this conversion and then it shouldn't be an obstacle really to use it. And I also suppose that it's not so well known here in Europe because uh, in the beginning and over a long period of time it was only used uh, for treadmill testing and not for uh, bicycle testing. Comments? Not? 
Ich habe eine kurz eine kleine Kommentar. Ich glaube, den agla kalkulator ist für die Praxis, für die Allgemeinpraktik sehr, sehr nützlich. Ich glaube, das wäre auch, ich rede als Hausarzt natürlich, als Internist, wo wir eben den Risikostratifizierung bei normalen Patienten in Anführungszeichen machen. Aber das ist jetzt interessant, dass gerade das in der Praxis dann zum Teil äh, verwechselt wird, dass wir auf der einen Seite einen Risikoscore haben für die kardiovaskuläre Prävention und da haben wir einen Risikoscore, welcher eigentlich ein Ausmaß für die Ischämie ist, indirekt mit der Fahrradergometrie und nachher uns einen Hinweis geht, ob, gibt, ob wir den medikamentös, also du hast gesagt, optimale medikamentöse Therapie, allenfalls in der Intermediate Risk Group, das hat ja nichts zu tun primär mit dem kardiovaskulären Risikoscore. I think that's a very important remark, uh, the Agla score. And the Agla score is a prognostic tool. You predict uh, potential events in the future, but you don't predict ischemia or stenosis. And so that's an important distinction we have here. Of course, sometimes uh, the uh, tests we do um, deliver congruent results for diagnosis and prognosis. However, uh, some tests only deliver uh, prognostic results as the Agla score. Um, yeah, Still, please. Uh, Stefan? If you have a good prognosis according to Agla score and you're asymptomatic, what do you care about ischemia or disease in the coronaries? So why do you have to diagnose coronary disease anyhow? Actually, we know that even if, especially in the intermediate uh, Agla risk score, we know that uh, cardiac imaging modalities provide further risk stratification and we, they reclassify patients, either a lot of patients, either in the low risk or in the high risk cohort, and then we have a different management. Francesco? Um, yes, first of all, uh, I did appreciate your presentation. It was very good. Um, for a simple-minded surgeon, uh, the first part was rather complicated because you had a lot of diagrams and scores and stuff and probably... Too complicated. Would... <laughs> it isn't complicated. <laughs> but anyway, for the surgeon, we'll, uh, as a surgeon, uh, we uh, were one of the first who introduced scores, score system, Euroscore and SDS score and all that stuff. And now we realize that score actually, it's not, it doesn't represent always the truth. So we have scores and uh, many of the, uh, not only in the coronary artery disease, probably the syntax is the best example of that. Current syntax is the first way in which we could differentiate, which is the best indication for doing performing a coronary artery bypass or, or PCI. But we have also in the, in, the, in the valvular disease a similar problem. We have the SDS called Euroscore, and then we find out that probably is not enough to differentiate exactly the patient. So I think that the most important point of this presentation, in my view, is the last slide, where you, dis you showed us that there is a big yellow ball, and in that you see the heart team discussion. So we found out, for example, that it's very important, especially for valve patients, but also for coronaries, to see what is the fra fragility of the patient. And this may change a, a, a decision which has been based on the scores. And then you say, well, I mean, this patient is not going to make to an operation. So we have to do the PCA, although the, the, the score may be a syntax over a 23 or something like that. So I think, um, I really think that uh, uh, this um, hard team approach is, is the, the thing that has been changed radically changed the attitude toward the, the treatment of the patient. And I think it's the, it's the best, best chance that we have to help the patient in, in, in a real way. I certainly think that the heart team idea is a very important idea. However, uh, if you look at uh, study data, we know that if you look at overall populations, so uh, the prognosis is always, uh, almost the same if you revascularize uh, by uh, PCI or uh, cabbage surgery. The only difference uh, in all these studies war, was that uh, patients had to undergo several procedures. And of course, in some uh, sub-cohorts, uh, uh, cabbage surgery did better, for example, in a bar tooth 
trial uh, with uh, diabetic patients who underwent uh, cabbage, of course. And that uh, underscores once more the importance uh, of uh, the heart team approach. Last question, last remark. Yes, you have the last word again. A word again. No, no, I don't want to have the last word, but I think all these um, different guidelines, they lack some information. Um, we always say it's a high-risk patient. He has a, a risk of 5% to die within the next 10 years or so. And on that, we base our intervention. Uh, I think we should have new views to assess risk and to look at what we gain when we intervene. And um, we say there is a risk reduction of 20% uh, to develop a myocardial infarction within the next five years. But um, most of these interventions are um, life to lifetime, uh, lifelong interventions. And I think we should um, have some information what do we gain when we start treating or when we do um, a, a test. We, we have some information concerning PSA, for instance, in, in prostate uh, cancer and so on. But we should have similar information also for cardiovascular disease. That's, I think, lacks uh, now. I completely agree to that. But you have to uh, collect the data first. So uh, I think you have the last word, uh, Michael. What is the reason why we should use in the future this scores, this exercise stress score? Actually, because it provides a better estimate of prognosis. Okay.